Good morning, Bethany North. It's so good to be with you this morning, wherever you are tuning in from. It's an honor to have these moments together to sing and to worship. And this morning, we wanted to take this time in this first song to kind of make it our call to worship, to remember the love of God and the importance of standing in the love of God. And I love the lyrics of this song that says, when darkness tries to roll over my bones, we will worship and we will stand in the love of God. When sorrow comes to steal our joy, we will remember and worship and stand in the love of God. And when brokenness and pain is all that we know, even then we will worship and stand in the love of God. And those lyrics come straight from scripture from 1 John 4 that says, there is no fear in love. And that's our testimony. That's what we get to sing about this morning. And so will you join us and sing along as we begin? joining us. My name is Nathan Ryan. I'm on staff here at Bethany North, and it's great to have you here with us this morning in the second Sunday of Lent. What is Lent? Well, 
Lent is the 40 days before Easter that we take time to reflect and really get introspective of where we are. And I love this season. This season reminds me a lot of Advent with the anticipation of Christmas for Advent. It's the anticipation for Easter in this time of Lent. If you'd like to join us in this season of reading with us as a community through the book of Exodus, there's still time. You can still join up. Um, feel free to email me for um, a schedule if you'd like to join each, uh, each day of Lent between now and Easter. We are reading basically one chapter a day through the book of Exodus. And it's a, a really formative time uh, to just take a daily moment and read through scripture, knowing that uh, many around us are doing the same. So we invite you to that. Um, uh, for this time, I'd like to say thank you for for the gifts that are given, uh, your time, talent, and even your treasures uh, really help us during this time, make this possible for us to, to do what we're doing here this morning and uh, go beyond this, go into our community. So we're very thankful for, for your time and your talent and your, um, your treasure. And so let's pray for that uh, right now and continue in worship. Lord, um, we just take time to pause and say thank you and be grateful for this season of Lent where we can just set aside things, Lord, to remember how you modeled for us as you went out in the desert for 40 days at the start of your ministry to take time to spend with the Spirit with the Father and with the Son. And Lord, it's not a time for us to get clean and try to get right and present ourselves as um, something that we're not. But we're messy and we're dirty and we're broken, Lord, and you accept us as this. You welcome us in this state. So we're thankful and grateful for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the uh, blessing of many um, people's gifts. We pray that you multiply them and we pray for um, the rest of our time this morning. In your name. Oh God, you have done great things. 
when everything at times seems to be crumbling around us, Lord Jesus, you are our firm foundation. God, in you, in you, we can put our hope, God. In you, we can put our victories, God. God, weak to strong, Lord Jesus, that is what you do. Weak to strong, Lord Jesus. So God, I pray over every brokenness, every frailty, Lord Jesus, every weakness, Lord God. God, I pray over every single one of them, Lord Jesus, that you would be the cornerstone, the foundation, the truth in which they can stand and build and live and redeem, God. 
Lord Jesus, may dry bones awaken, Lord Jesus, and fight, God. Lord Jesus, I pray over every home, Lord Jesus, that is listening to this sermon on Sunday morning, broken or whole, Lord Jesus. I pray over every home that every eye would see and that every ear would hear, Lord Jesus, the hope that we have in you, Lord Jesus, the mountain of strength of the things eternal, God. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Hi, everyone. I'm Peter. And I'm Amy Beth. And we have been watching these children's stories with you, and we can't believe that we're already at the last week of Challenge Accepted. And we are really glad to hear over and over again that Jesus is with us in our challenges because, boy, have there been a lot of them lately. <laughs> there have. And you know, in today's story, Jesus faced a challenge, and he had to make a prediction. What's a prediction? Oh, well, it's kind of like if um, it's it's kind of like if you had to guess at something that was going to happen in the future. You mean if like if I challenged you to a thumb war? Hey, <laughs> and I guessed that I was going to win. Well, I guess that I'm gonna win. Ready? What do you guys think? What's your prediction? Hmm. One, One two, three, three, four. I, I declare, declare a thumb war. Ho, ho, ha, <laughs> <laughs> ah! Oh, did you think I was going to win? Or did you think she was going to win? Now, here's the really amazing thing. Throughout the Bible, Jesus makes a lot of predictions, but he doesn't have to guess on what's going to happen. He knew. That's right. So he then, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again from the dead. Huh, that reading from the Bible says that Jesus predicted he was going to die. Yeah, you know, if one of my friends came up to me and told me that he was going to die, and then three days later he was going to rise from the dead, I might have kind of a hard time believing him. Do you think the disciples might have had a hard time believing Jesus too? I understand why. What, yeah. else, what else does it say? Well, Jesus then called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. You see, Jesus was reminding his disciples and us Anyone who loves God has to do what God wants them to do, even when it's not what they want to do. That's a hard challenge to accept, but I'm so thankful that Jesus understands how hard that is and that he walks with us in those hard challenges. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us for this story and for this series. And today at the junction from two to four, there is a family Lenten box pickup. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. Bye. Friends, our scripture reading today is from Exodus 16. 1 through 15 in the Common English Bible. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the Sin Desert, which is located between Elam and Sinai. They set out on the 15th day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. The whole Israelite community complained against Moses and Aaron in the desert. The Israelites said to them, Oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put to death while we were still in the land of Egypt. There we could sit by the pots cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you brought us out into this desert to starve this whole assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to make bread rain down from the sky for you. The people will go out each day and gather just enough for that day. In this way, I'll test them to see whether or not they follow my instruction. On the sixth day, when they measure out what they have collected, it will be twice as much as they collected on other days. So, 
Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the Lord's glorious presence, because your complaints against the Lord have been heard. Who are we? Why blame us? Moses continued, The Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord heard the complaints you made against him. Who are we? Your complaints aren't against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole Israelite community, Come near to the Lord, because he's heard your complaints. As Aaron spoke to the whole Israelite community, they turned to look toward the desert. And just then, the glorious presence of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses. I've heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will have your fill of bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, a flock of quail flew down and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the desert surface were thin flakes, as thin as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? They didn't know what it was. Moses said to them, This is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with us as we prepare for the sermon and teaching? Lord, you care for your community. You care for your beloved. You care for your children, Lord, in ways that are more marvelous than we can possibly fathom. You provided food for your people, Israel, and in amazing ways. And you do... Thank you, Nathan, for reading our scripture. Uh, Good morning. Uh, I'm Raul Perez. I'm the senior associate pastor here at North. Uh, And uh, today's message uh, on the second Sunday of Lent is called Grumbling and Grace in the Wilderness. And today's text, as you heard, is all about food. People are hungry for food. Food's falling from the sky. Birds are crashing into the sand. Everybody's just looking to get something to eat. So I kind of thought, well, why not start this sermon with a a story about food? So growing up, I grew up in Southern California, large family, uh, every every reason (laughs) in the season to get together. Uh, But we would get together on Thanksgiving at our house. My dad and my mom were the oldest in their family, so it's all at our house. And uh, we got 30, 35 people in the house, and we would, uh, we would throw down a huge feast, and we would just uh, be together, hang out, have fun, lots of laughing, lots of food. The men would do this ridiculous thing where they would see how many rounds of food they could eat, literally plates of food you could eat, uh, and it was just this ridiculous stuff, you know, guys do. So. Uh, and at the end of the night, um, I remember many times distinctly going up to my mom and saying, oh, Mom, hey, thanks, this was, this was good, but uh, the turkey was a little dry this year. Uh, it, it was good, it was good, it was just, just dry. Or, uh, no pecan pie, just pumpkin pie this year, no, no pecan? You know, whatever, just finding any reasons to just, uh, just complain, essentially. And I just remember my mom would, would respond to me in kind, something like, mijo, that's as they call it, you know, mi, hijo, my son, mijo, you get it. Mijo, if you're so focused on what's missing, you may have just missed the feast. And I think she was talking about more than just the food. She's talking about everything else around it. I'm so focused on what I'm not getting that I just missed the beautiful feast that I got to partake in. And that's what's happening here. That's what's happening here in this text. Hebrews have just been brought out of Egypt, and they're in the shadow of this miracle where God reached down and parted the seas, and they walked through to freedom from slavery and dry land. They worshiped and praised, and then they're walking into the promised land. They're they're on their way. They're on their way. They're free. And all they can think about is the pots of meat that 
they got to eat from while they were enslaved. The drinks, the free bread, all this stuff that was provided to them while they were shackled and beaten and told to build Egypt all around them. All they could think about was what they were missing. And in a sense, they're hangry. They're, <laughs> they're hungry and angry in the desert, and they're pointing that all at Moses and Aaron. And like me, the Israelites let the demands of their stomach cause them to trade gratitude for grumbling. How often in scripture have we seen that the simple comforts of food are what cause some to fall into disobedience? Adam and Eve saw the food, the fruit on the tree, and they saw that it was, it was good for them and good for knowing. And so they took it and they ate and they sinned. What about Esau? Esau for a, a, a simple pot of what scripture calls his red stuff, lentil stew. He gives up his birthright to his brother and he despises it from that day forward. And now we hear the Israelites because of their hunger, they would, they, they're in a spiritual dangerous place where it might cause them to be disobedient. Our stomachs, you know, they can be like, like little kings. Let's call it king's stomach. And king's stomach demands to be served, satiated, and prioritized. This is, this is what we would call a me first mentality. And the thing is, I definitely struggle with a me first mentality. Even when I read scripture, like when I read the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus is uh, uh, testing the disciples and testing their faith. And when I read it, I think that I'm, I'm one of the disciples. And when I'm watching Jesus take these fish and these loaves and he, and he multiplies them and he has everybody served and fed 5,000 plus people, I'm, in my eyes, I'm, I'm kind of seeing this all happen and I'm saying, what about me? Jesus, why don't you feed me? Why don't you fill me up? And I can't even see what is before me. And while I'm so focused on how I'm not being fed, I can't feed the others. For any of you who likewise struggle with this uh, me first reaction, uh, it's important to recognize that it's, it's rooted in sin. Yes, it's definitely rooted in sin, but more, I think, empathetically, it's, it's rooted in feeling left out, in feeling unseen, feeling forgotten, feeling invisible or invaluable leads to us complaining in our hearts and complaining with our mouths. But here's the thing, our belief in how valuable we are is really just based in perception. Perception is shaped by many factors, but I would tell you that whatever drives your priorities has a big hand in it. Are your priorities to feed King's stomach, the heart of our worldly hopes and desires? Or is your priority to serve King Jesus, the heart of our true selves and perfect love? The former, King's stomach, will drive you to insatiable dissatisfaction in yourself and with others. It will lead you to insatiable dissatisfaction with yourself and others. The latter, King Jesus, will draw you to fulfillment in him and a desire to give yourself to others. So here's the good news. The good news in this text is that God has grace for our grumbling. Even in the desert when we're, when we're struggling and we're complaining to our leaders and we're complaining to God, God has grace for us. And he helps us see. He helps us see and be thankful for the bread of life that's given to us. And he goes even further. He shows us how to give that bread away before it rots in us. This is the good news that's in this text. So let's get into it. Let's get into that first point. God has grace for our grumbling. 
So let's look at the text here, and it says in verse 2, just, it, it just kind of lays out the Israelites grumbling and complaining against Moses and Aaron. The whole Israelite community complained against Moses and Aaron in the desert. The Israelites said to them, Oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put us to death while we're still in the land of Egypt. There we could sit by the pots of cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you've brought us out into the desert to starve this whole assembly to death. They're dreaming about where they came from. They would rather trade the ability to just eat food and have drink as much as they want in slavery than be free people who have to depend on God for their food. And so... They complain. They complain so much that it it just, uh, it kind of begins to crush Moses and Aaron. And in verse 8, Moses said, The Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning because the Lord heard the complaints you made against him. Who are we? Who are we? Your complaints aren't against us, but against the Lord. And so you kind of see Moses and Aaron like, whoa, it's, it, don't, don't complain to us. Complain to the Lord. Your complaints are going to God. And so with the Israelites and Moses and Aaron just exacerbated, the Lord, in a surprising move, those complaints actually draw the glory of the Lord to them. God becomes present to them because they complained. It says in verse 10, as Aaron spoke to the whole Israelite community, they turned to look towards the desert. And just then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And then it goes further and it says that God meets their needs. The Lord spoke to Moses. I've heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight, you will eat meat. And in the morning, you will have your fill of bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. It's an interesting question. Why would complaining about what is missing draw God's presence and continued provision to the Israelites? Normally, complaining causes us, at least, uh, you know, me, (laughs) it causes me to take a step back and I don't know, why don't you kind of take a breath and take a minute? But in this case, God draws close. Why? Why? I think it's because God is our good heavenly father and mother. You know, the other day, uh, my boys were, uh, you know, they were all hyped up. I think we had just like turned off a show and then after a show, they get all hyped up. And so they're, they're, they're kind of like chasing each other around the house and, and they're beginning to uh, pester their mom and, and kind of be mean to her, be bossy to her, get me this, get me that. And then uh, all of that uh, frustration in a way kind of turned, the boys turned on each other and they got into this big fight. And in my head, I'm like, ah, eye for an eye, right? Tit for tat. They were bothering their mom and now they're bothering each other and now they got it, whatever, you know? But uh, my wife, bless her heart, um, she didn't take this tack. She didn't trade evil for evil. She traded, uh, she gave good for evil. And um, so uh, my middle son uh, exploded and he had a meltdown. And so my wife went up to him and instead of kind of poking fun at him or anything, uh, she went in and she talked to him about how he was feeling, the feelings he couldn't even articulate, the things he couldn't even get in touch with and know what was happening, why he was exploding. My wife was calmly talking to him while she's screaming. <laughs> He's still screaming at her and eventually talked him down to this place where he just crumbled and cried in her lap. And after a good cry, um, he kind of was able to bounce back and the boys uh, got back in together instead to have a you know, play and play well. And I think, truly, that God, uh, he really attempts to be like we are as parents. He's trying to to love us and care for us and attend to our needs. He, He recognizes that our complaints go a little deeper. Our complaints reflect the pain and the hurt that is deeper inside of us. And as a good father and a good mother is attempting to draw us out of ourselves, he says, I see you. I love you. 
and I want to provide for you. And it's with certain desires. God has certain desires in that. He desires to draw us away from grumbling into an attitude of gratitude. Why? Why is God trying to do that? I I think it's because God knows that a grateful person is more likely to share their bread than a dissatisfied person. I think some want to fight for their right to grumble, right? Uh, The right to complain about what King's stomach wants and is frustrated by. Well, in truth, you have that right. 1 Corinthians 10 says that in Christ, all things are permissible. In Christ, all things have been made available and are permissible for us. But, hear me, not all things are profitable, not all things are expedient, not all things build up yourself and the others around you. Consider the main point again. Sharing the bread of life is to give God to others. I didn't say that at the beginning. I said again. Hear it for the first time. Sharing the bread of life is to give God to others. So ask yourselves, does your grumbling point others to the bread of life? Another way to ask it is, is your grumbling telling others that the bread of life in you is insufficient to meet your needs and your wants and your desires? How good is the manna from heaven if you are complaining about your life so often? Yes, we all get disappointed and react in frustration and we complain that is totally human. But what I want us to be mindful in the midst of that is really who our complaints are to. Moses tells the people, your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. If you really want resolution and true care for your complaints, and truly not all do, some want to sit in those complaints. Take them first to the one who will give you true empathy and compassion. Mourning and crying out to God, being vulnerable and being honest with our hurts. Asking God if he sees our hurts, our hunger, if he sees our hearts. In this way, God has grace for our grumblings, meeting our needs at the source and filling us with true bread to share with others in place of complaints. So, I say to the leaders, uh, group leaders, listening to uh, this sermon, if complaints come your way, do not take them personally. Do not take them personally. Listen for and ask about what hurts are below the surface, and pray for your people, commending them to God. In church, I would encourage you, to take your complaints to the Lord and see what he responds to you with. And certainly bring them to your leaders, bring them to your family. I'm not saying don't do that. But I am saying, let's start at the source. Let's start at the one who can truly meet our needs. And in this way, both leaders and church will rightly deal with disappointments and complaints so that they result in being filled up with true bread that we can give out to others. You know, when I was little, again, growing up in uh, California, we would uh, go camping. We had this camper. Um, but occasionally, my dad would take me out hiking. And so we would tent camp. And when you tent camp at night, dew covers everything. It even gets on the inside of the tent. And so when I would wake up in the morning, I would carefully get out of my sleeping bag and try and zip the tent gently so it doesn't shake any condensation or dew off. And then I would get outside, but unfortunately outside there's more dew on the grass and there's dew, on the, there's dew everywhere. It's all over the place. And I was miffed. As a, as a young guy, I was, I was just miffed that there was just this mist and this dew all over the place. And I think it's because I just really didn't understand how life was in it. You know, dew is the primary way that plants and animals uh, living in the desert are sustained. Without the dew of the morning, life would cease in the desert. So we read here in verses 13 through 15 what it talks about, about the dew. In the evening, a flock of quail flew down and covered the camp. 
and in the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the desert surface were thin flakes, as thin as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? They didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. So our second point is that we are to recognize and be grateful for the bread of life. Moses here does this for the Israelites. He tells them, this is the bread from heaven. Later he'll, he'll call it, this is manna. It's from God. And Jesus likewise does this for the Jews when they question him. When they question him about this miracle in the desert that God does for their ancestors. And they say, what miraculous sign will you do that we can see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus told them, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And now they're intrigued. And they say, sir, give us this bread all the time. And Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You see, in the same way that the Spirit of God hovered over everything at creation, and in the same way that the dew of the morning rests on all things, so also the body of Christ covers the whole world. Literally draws us in through the wound in his side. And his body covers everything from our sins to our bodily needs to our emotional turmoil, our spiritual hunger, and our curiosity. Jesus, through Holy Spirit, is the dew that rests on us in the morning and fully satisfies us. And I would say, if you don't know Jesus today, but you want to know him, you desire a good thing. Because God is the only thing that will never forsake you or leave you. He is what you have been searching for. So I would, I would invite you, if you don't know Jesus, you want to know Jesus, to invite him into you. To say, Jesus, I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. To be that bread that will fill me and satisfy me like nothing else. And I hope you will contact me and let me know, because I would love to come baptize you, backyard baptism, and we will be on this journey together. But for the rest of us, I want to say, do we recognize, do we recognize who Jesus is and the bread of life? Verse 4 says, then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to make bread rain down from the sky for you. The people will go out each day and gather just enough for that day. In that way, I'll test them to see whether or not they follow my instruction. What was God's instruction? God's instruction was to gather only enough for each person in one's household. Why? Why only gather enough each day for each person in the household? It's so that they may recognize and be grateful to the giver of the manna. So they may have faith in the morning that there would be fresh dew, fresh manna. As Jesus told us, their daily bread. This grows new and fresh faith in us. You know, before I was a pastor, I, uh, uh, when I was in seminary, I became like a, a, a worship team chaplain. And it was a wonderful uh, position to play for a time. And uh, I built really wonderful and um, meaningful relationships with those uh, worship team members. And I remember we took, uh, me and the worship leader took them on a retreat. And uh, we went to this camp. And yeah, actually at the camp, I ended up almost breaking my ankle and 
uh, playing nighttime <laughs> uh, capture the flag you know, while my wife was eight months pregnant. I mean, it was a whole thing. It was a whole deal. That aside, at the end of that camp with my foot up and like I'm all like, you know, messed up, for about three hours, we did this thing called prayer chair. And we sat each person down in the middle and we prayed over them. And we prayed and we listened. And what we were listening for was the names that God had for each one of those worship team members. And I remember that uh, this one gal named Caitlin, her name was uh, Faithful. That's the name that she received. But she would always come up to me and she'd be, pillar, pillar. And she'd like want a hug and we would chat. And it was so amazing to be known by a name that God had given me. And I'm sure likewise for her. But what I experienced through that, through those unique names that God had given and us calling the, that to one another is that God had fresh bread given to them for me and for, in me for them. It kept me uh, believing that God wanted to speak and God wanted to move and God wanted to do things through me and these, these worship team members in this church. It was an incredible gift. Having faith that the bread of life will show up and sustain you each day is to begin to serve King Jesus rather than feeding King's stomach. When we are filled with bread and serving King Jesus, we will want to serve and share with others as well. In fact, we must serve others lest the bread of life rots in us. And that's our last point. Do not. Let the bread rot in you. Do not let the bread rot in you. Verses 18 through 20. Everyone collected just as much as they could eat. Moses said to them, don't keep any of it until morning. But they didn't listen to Moses. Some kept part of it until morning. uh, But it became infested with worms and stank. Moses got angry with them. It is necessary to give the bread you've received to others so they may know the great giver of life, who is Jesus, and so it doesn't become stale and infested and rot in you. It's just like a cistern of water. Unless water is drawn out and fresh water is let in on a regular basis, the water becomes brackish. You know what happens when Brackish water goes unattended. It will damage the environment it's in because it's hostile to new growth. Or it's like a packet of seeds, right? There's a reason they print a date on those packages. Because after too many years of just just sitting there, those seeds become sterile. And when planted, no life comes from them. Or it's like my own fear of rejection from my neighbor. The fear of rejection that has prevented me from truly sharing about the bread of life that's been given to me with him. You know, we've been neighbors for over two years and we've had actually a lot of time together. We've done projects together. and uh, He's a a spiritual guy and he's exploring a lot of different things and, and he knows about Christianity and we've had talks, and I've said I'm a pastor, and that throws a wrench in things that it always does. But I, I honestly have been, I think, scared to have him reject me as a neighbor and for us to not have any further contact because I told him about Jesus. I invited him to know Jesus like, uh, and to know the, just truly how good those gifts are that I'm experiencing. And I think I've honestly failed to, to minister to him. We all have fears and failures like this, like mine. We have all let brackish water back up in our hearts. We have all let seeds die right there in our hands. But Jesus, the dew and the bread of life, rests on each of us, each morning. Any morning we recognize it, receive it, eat it, we are forgiven and refreshed by the spirit that comes with it. The goal for each new day then 
is to seek to give away that which has been given to us. It is to serve King Jesus by receiving him and serving others. Sharing the bread of life is to give God to others. Because of that, today we're going to take communion. See, I know at times that communion can seem just like a ritual. It can seem simply symbolic. But here's the thing. It wasn't symbolic for the Israelites in Egypt, was it? When they were told that they should slaughter a one-year-old lamb and take its blood and, and paint it on their doorposts, do you know what that was? That was the difference between life and death. And so when the disciples gather with Jesus, they disciple at, uh, over the Passover festival. And they are celebrating when the angel of death flew over the Israelites because they painted their doors because they were obedient to what Jesus said. Jesus, God, you know, you know. So when they're there, what they're celebrating inherently is praising God between the difference of life and death and that they've been offered life. And Jesus is now going to redefine who the lamb is. He's going to, in a very cryptic way, take bread in the meal and he would break it and he would show them and he'd say, this, this is my body and it's broken for you. As often as you eat of it, remember me. Jesus' his body broken for you. Let's receive that. And in like manner, at the end of the meal, he would take the cup and he would bless it. And he'd say, this is my blood. My blood shed for you. The blood of the new covenant. And when he was saying new covenant, what he was saying was that there was no longer going to be the need for animal sacrifice because that was but a shadow of what was to come. And that, was, that only just punted the sin problem down the field, right? No, Jesus was saying, I'm going to establish a new covenant with you in my body and in my blood so that once and for all, sin is covered and you may be new creations sitting at my right hand with me and my Father, all of us together in community through my blood and they had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> but we do. But we do. And that's why communion is not just a symbol. It is imbued with life. It is imbued with the Spirit of God, not just here in this chapel, but in each one of your homes. So the blood of Jesus shed for us. Let's receive. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for these common elements and how you take the most common thing, even dirt, to create humanity, bread, and wine, to allow your spirit to fill and, and live in so that we may receive, so that we may be changed, so that we may be your temples, that your spirit lives within, and we may be your people that you want to you wanna be co-heirs with, so that we can share the good news with anyone who wants to listen about this good bread of life that is living in us. Help us to share about the one who saved our lives. Father God, I thank you for this day and I thank you for all who have come to seek you. Any who are hungry, would you feed them, Lord? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue. You are love, you are all together good. 
Jesus told us how to pray. He said for us to ask our Father, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Understand that Jesus has forgiven your sins. He has wiped you clean. And that's only the beginning. That's not the end game. What he's trying to do is for you to be faithfully dependent on him, desperate for the bread that only he can give. And he wants you to do it daily, seeking out fellowship, seeking him in the word, 
seeking him in prayer, receiving communion as often as you can. And in like way, turning around and giving it away as fast as you can. <laughs> because the world needs hope. And it needs the bread that only Jesus can give. So go into the world, unfearing, giving away all that you have so that others may receive it because there is no limit to the bread that God will give the church. God bless you. Go in peace.